Let's open with a word of prayer. Grace of God, we ask your presence be in this room as we look at your word as it may speak to us and direct our lives for paths of discipleship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, So we talked about uh, the journey in the book so far, about picking up uh, the post-resurrection of Jesus, uh, the replacement of uh, the disciple Judas to get back to the number 12, the day of Pentecost happening, Peter giving his first sort of post-resurrection sermon, if you will, the converts to, and the new life that Peter and John are speaking out. They are arrested, but yet they are released. Uh, the church is growing with the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, the giving in new community. We talked about the two that tried to hold back a little bit and what happened to them. Uh, the apostles uh, proclaim in the temple about Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament, which you know is going to end up being in trouble, and they are arrested again. They're brought before um, the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling, highest ruling council of the Jewish authorities, uh, one of the most respected, uh, sort of wise person of the Jewish faith, says, let it go. If it's anything, it'll take root. If not, it'll just burn itself out. So just quit trying to make situation worse by highlighting it. And... Um, so they sort of let go again. And then when we were wrapping up, sort of last time, we started a, a sixth chapter with the appointment of the seven deacons and those names, which we don't know really much about any of them, uh, except for Stephen, which we're going to start talk about then today. But I thought, again, to sort of as a, uh, I want to do two refreshers today with a video. The first one is the refresher of what... Uh, the entire book to get your mind back into it that we did at the very beginning of that first session, which is the entire book in uh, three minutes. So we'll just kind of do that, th- that one again. Under house arrest and continues to preach the gospel while awaiting trial. And that is all we know of Paul's story. 
Somewhere in there, he finds the time to write a few letters. Today, they comprise much of the New Testament. The New Testament is also where you'll find the book of Acts. The end. Okay. <laughs> That's, I think it's so clever. And, uh, yeah, so... Okay, so that kind of gets you, I really think it does a good job, not only entertaining, but it really does do a good job of summarizing, summarizing things and so forth. So I wanted to kind of pick up, as you can see, we picked up there with the deacons uh, being appointed, and then we move into the story of Stephen, which is where I want to kind of pick things up then today. So uh, in our series, we did the first seven verses when we wrapped up last time in November, but uh, let's, so let's pick up with uh, verse 8 and go through uh, 15. 15, if somebody would read that. Okay, that actually finishes the chapter, so a shorter chapter before we get into a real long one. Again, it's interesting how they did the chapters and verses always to me, why they group in certain ways. But uh, so we talked about in those opening verses of chapter six, the seven deacons, which we don't know a whole lot about. Um, There is um, up in those verses, Prochorus, as I think I mentioned before, that some believe that there's some stories about him that uh, John was the one, he dictated his gospel to him, but there's, you know, that we find these kind of references, but we don't know a whole lot. But when we come to the story of Stephen, a short story, but probably a very powerful um, story. We start out with, um, in verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power, um, did great wonders and signs. So that's, that's a pretty... Um, high, strong uh, description of this man. So he must have been very dynamic right off the bat. This guy, uh, very charismatic, if you will, in a way that uh, he immediately sort of rose to the top and and spoke out and became well-known very quickly. But what we have here then is that we have some then mention of people that are getting upset of this. Of course, we know that so far, we are heading, we are moving down this um, story of this confrontation happening. We already know that with the life of Jesus, the temple, Jesus' actions in the temple, Jesus' arrest, Jesus' trial, where that led Jesus, and everything is sort of heading down that same road again because they are not being bashful at all about, let's, well, let's go a couple miles away from the temple and do this. You know, so we stay out of trouble. There is no thinking of that whatsoever. They are um, full of the Holy Spirit. They're ready to go. Um, And so we have these people from uh, different synagogues now. Again, remember, we have the one main temple, and then we have the synagogues that basically were run by the Pharisees um, out in these different areas. And so these folks um, are people that are not sort of the in-town people. These are sort of the out-of-town synagogue goers, if you will. Uh, It's not much known about this term here in verse 9, freedmen. Um, Some say this was a synagogue that was started by when Pompey uh, conquered, that he um, 
uh, jailed some Jewish folks, and then it was just these Jewish folks that were free that sort of started their synagogue, and so then it had that reputation. Just like sort of anything else in our community, we may have certain reputations about a community of faith because of something they did, but it may have been 30 years ago, but it still referred to that church but that did that, even though maybe people in the in the the building and who go there don't even weren't alive when that even happened, but it gets reputation. So we don't know a whole lot. Some suggest that maybe it would, had some roots with that. Um, these other folks, Alexandrians, Syrians, they are all from other places, from Asia, um, but they are offended. They stand up against uh, Stephen. But here's the challenge. Stephen is speaking with the Holy Spirit, as we see in verse 10. They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. So if you can't win above board, but you want to win, what do you do? You go below board, okay? So what do they do? They secretly instigate some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And then they stirred up the people as well as the elders and scribes. So you have the people and the elders and scribes as, as well. Um, and again, if this, the story of Stephen, if this is echoing, remember, if we go back and the, the author of the Acts of the Apostle, remember, is the author of the Gospel of Luke. And this pattern, this, this, this journey to the cross of Christ is being paralleled here with exactly the sort of same things that are happening to Stephen as well. So they can't, Jesus um, uh, amazes the religious authorities. He teaches in the temple. They, they, he, they try to stump them. He gets them back. And so they say, well, let's go get some people and, re and, and let's make up some stories, okay? Same thing that's happened here with Stephen. If we can't get them our way, we'll get them, we'll get them the, uh, by way of different uh, path, and that path is to get false witnesses. So they set up these false witnesses, um, and they make the charge that he's doing something against Moses and God, which is exactly uh, in what they do and say that Jesus is doing in Luke chapter 5, 21. Actually, I wrote down here, they make that same sort of charge. Um, and then this, uh, he's, this man never, in verse 13, they set up false witnesses who said, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. If you want to hit double, two things with the Jewish faith at this time, hit the holy place and the law. I mean, that, that, and he never stops. He never stops saying things against them. Okay, this is the charges that are, are going up. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Remember, that also was destroy this temple in three days and bring it back. Also came up and will change the customs. Okay, now we're really <laughs> change. You're going to change the customs. Good grief. You're, that, that's good enough. We don't even need to care if he's against the holy place of the law. If he's going to change the custom, let's get rid of him right now. Um, so humans are humans are humans, okay? Uh, and so he's in front of the council. This is a Sanhedrin. They all... Um, um, look at him uh, intently. They're focused in and saw that his face was like that of an angel. Okay? Uh, again, thinking about Jesus as well as Moses now. And Moses in the burning bush, his face be having this encounter with God. Uh, the author here, Luke, is not uh, choosing these words by accident. They're on purpose. Uh, of what's going to unfold and who these, these people are, um, who Stephen represents. You get Moses and Jesus going. You got the, the old, the, what we would call the old covenant um, and the new covenant uh, all being paralleled right here into this moment with the person Stephen and what's about to happen. Okay, let's go to um, the, the chapter 7, which is a very long chapter. Um, very a uh, lot of verses here, but let's read. Um, let's tackle the first eight. First eight. Anybody? Okay.
and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and go to the land that I will show you. Then he left the country of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After his father died, God had him moved from there to this country in which you are now living. He did not give him any of it as a heritage, not even a foot's length, but he promised to give it to him as his possession and to his descendants after him, even though he had no child. And God spoke in these terms that his descendants would be resident aliens in a country belonging to others, who would enslave them and maltreat them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. Okay, thank you. So here we have this um, speech. This is going to be the longest speech in the book of Acts. Uh, this is going to be a long uh, story, but this is probably one of the best um, distilled story of the Old Testament in these verses that we are reading. If you want to, you know, don't want to read the old, all that Old Testament and you want to get a sense of what the Old Testament is about, come to chapter 7 of the book of the Acts of the Apostles and you're going to get a great summary, okay? So it's interesting that we sort of have the Old Testament summarized in the New Testament in this way. Now, verse 7 started, Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? So, the high priest is speaking. So this, this is official business now. And let's kind of think about this as the Supreme Court. The chief justice just said, Make your argument. Okay, so that's sort of what what is at stake here is the high priest is speaking. It's sort of uh, official now. And uh, so we have this accounting and and we have this asked question. Are these things so? So he's given him his chance to make his defense. But what Stephen is doing here, Stephen speaks not to make a defense of his life. He's not saying so you should let me go. Never says that. He's talking about, he's making a proclamation here. This is his opportunity to proclaim the gospel event, and he's going to work through the Old Testament and, and do that. Now, he starts by then recounting with Abraham the story of the Old Covenant, what would be the covenant at that time, the covenant God makes with Abraham. He starts there. So, again, going back to the whole Supreme Court analogy, it's sort of like saying, let me tell you, here's how a rule becomes a law. And he's telling this to the Supreme Court justices, okay? So these are people that are the most learned of the faith, and he's going to now give them a lesson on their Jewish history. But notice what he's doing here. I, I think it's comparable to say, uh, if you're, the history that Stephen's going to point out here it's not necessarily, I, I wouldn't use the word cherry-picked, but in some ways, that's what he's going to do. He's going to lift out these passages that do that. So, um, if you're arguing in front of the Supreme Court that a black man should not be a slave in the year 2020, you may talk about the history of our country, you're probably going to bring up the Civil War, you're probably going to bring up the things in our history that support this sort of line through this thread, if you will, through history. And so this is what Stephen's going to kind of do. So he starts by saying, um, ancestor, he's saying, this goes back to Abraham, this is the beginning, this is the, when the covenant first happens. Um, this is like 2,000 years ago. And again, he tells them the story that they already know. But look at this. He said, you know, he's telling them the story. After his father died, God had to move from there to this country in which you are now living. Okay, so the promise made to Abraham is realized. 
Now, they would know the story of Abraham, but it has not yet materialized. Uh, when, it, when it's Abraham, it took a long time before it's this country that you are now in. So he's starting to say, you know, maybe the promises of God, of Jesus Christ, aren't going to happen right now with snap of the fingers. That's going to be a theme through this as well. Also, think of yourself as the first readers of this book who are also suffering and thinking God's going to act, Jesus is going to be back in my lifetime, and this hasn't happened yet. But as we get through the story, this whole sense of waiting, God's patient, God will act in God's own time, sort of this, this is also being a thread that's running through all of this as well. Um, and so he starts lifting up his promises. He, you know, he, Abraham doesn't give this as a heritage. He, it's not a foot's length. He's, you know, it wasn't promised to him because of that. It's, um, he's promised that he'll be a great nation, even though he has no child. Again, God's promise is going to be realized. Um, in uh, verse 6, the latter part, he, they, they ended up in Egypt, where for 400 years they're enslaved. Still, the promise not realized. Um, God's going to act in God's own time. Uh, and then after that, um, he's talking about they'll come out and worship me in this place. Um, Stephen is saying, you know, the legitimacy of the temple. Um, it's going to be destroyed. Um, however, and as people read this, it, it probably was destroyed already by that. Um, he talks about the covenant of circumcision, that promise, and lifts up Isaac and Jacob uh, and their roles as well. So we sort of get to that point and where we then the promise takes a new form because we have um, we don't necessarily refer to the um, sons of Jacob being the 12 patriarchs. That's language we really don't use. We talk about the 12 tribes of Israel um, as his sons, but even that um, only 10 Ten of the sons of the tribes, it's actually the two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, if I'm recalling correctly, are the two other tribes of Joseph that make up the 12 tribes. Um, there isn't a tribe of, uh, of Joseph, and um, it's his two sons, and uh, the one who, uh, I think it's Simeon, maybe, who doesn't, it's the one who betrayed him, uh, Judah, maybe. I apologize, I'm drawing a blank. But uh, So we think about the 12 tribes from Jacob's sons, but he talks about them as patriarchs, but people would sort of think about that if that was your tribe, that was your lineage. You know, we talk about, you know, the, 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 that lineage of where you belong was very important at that time. So let's switch over then and go down here through um, uh, 16, 9 through 16, as it continues the story with the next chapter, because we have the three patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, but then that takes a new turn. When they go to Egypt, there's a different form because it's Joseph that, that is, uh, is, uh, comes to, into um, place there. So somebody would read uh, 9 through uh, 16 that we get the story here of Joseph. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. No, that's great. Um, thank you. And so here we have sort of the summary story uh, of Joseph and the role of Egypt and how he is. But what do we know about these um, patriarchs that he refers to them? They become jealous of Joseph. Guess who's jealous of Stephen and jealous of um, Jesus are the religious authorities. So he sort of 
stir in that pot, if you will, about this guy was rejected, and guess what? He, you now know he was the guy, and his brothers rejected him. So he just kind of keeps coming at this, uh, and sort of, you know, another needle prod. Um, and then uh, I was going to mention here, in verse 14, he talks about when they go down to Egypt, Jacob and all his relatives come down. Um, there's 75 in all. Uh, if you look up Genesis 46, 27, it says 70. And this is one of those things that, um, why is that a big deal? Well, it's not really a big deal. But it's one of those things that um, shows that the writer of Luke is using the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, and not the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew says 70, but the Greek translation says 75. It's just one of those things. While it's not a big deal, it doesn't change the story, it's just one of those things that becomes an interesting point when people talk about the literalism of the Bible and of Scripture. There are certain things that are different. And that's why something like that, as Lutherans, we don't go, oh my gosh, go throw the Bible away. It conflicts. It's, it's, it's no good. As some people think that they have to come up with some kind of wording to make sure that that actually means the same thing. So they do all these sort of uh, uh, academic gymnastics to say, well, sometimes 70 meant 75. or so they, They've got to always, because to have that would take this whole thing away. And this is one of our, um, I'm being, this is being recorded, so I've got to be careful, but um, uh, one of those things with our Missouri Synod sisters and brothers, we use different words when we talk about the inerrancy of Scripture and the inspired word of Scripture. We, as ELCA Lutherans, do not say inerrant. Why? This would be an example of that. Look, we have two numbers. Oh, no, it's inerrant, or they would say, because that actually means the same thing. We're just understanding it wrong. So I'm summarizing there and, and broad strokes, really. But uh, it's just one of those things that becomes an interesting thing for people who go down that rabbit hole, if you will, of trying to make things make sense. That's an example of something that, that, that are, it's just different between the two translations. It doesn't mean, you know, and I, I, we use this whole thing, the witnesses of the car accident. They all saw the car accident, but somebody saw, it, then, you know, the left blinker was on, no, the right blinker was on. doesn't mean the accident didn't happen. But that's human interpretation. Humanity ends, is part of the interpretation. Um, I think um, Dr. Mark Powell, in his talking about the Scripture, puts it best, the Scripture says exactly what God wants the Scripture to say. And I think that's a, a great way to sort of summarize it and that, we, that part we trust. Okay, let's um, move on to um, this 17 through, uh, this is just a short, I'll read this little section here because I'm not going to say a whole lot about it here. But, but as the time drew near for the fulfillment of promise that God had made to Abraham, and this is, again, many years later. Our people in Egypt increased and multiplied until another king, who had not known Joseph, ruled over Egypt. He dealt craftily with our race and forced our ancestors to abandon their infants so that they would die. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful before God. For three months, he was brought up in his father's house. And when he was abandoned, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. So Moses was instructed and all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was powerful in his words and deeds. So now we have Moses introduced, and then we have this next session, um, beginning with 23 through 29, uh, this next section, uh, speaking with the story of Moses. When he was 40 years old, geez, there's an interesting number, uh, he came into his heart to visit his relatives, the Israelites, when he saw one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed, this verse, interesting, let's look at verse 25. He supposed that his kinsfolk would understand that God through him was rescuing them, but they did not understand. Interesting verse, okay? The next day he came to some of them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor pushed Moses aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When he heard this, 
Moses fled and became a resident alien in the land of Midian. There he became the father of two sons. So, he, the needle continues to be prodded, okay? You know, that um, he came to rescue, help them out, and they, it's his own kin. They don't want anything to do with them. So let's pick up with uh, 30. Somebody read through um, 34. Okay? Okay, thank you. Um, how many years had passed? Forty, shockingly. Uh, and, but at this point, a lot of uh, traditions, they divided Moses' life up into three 40-year segments. Okay, the first 40 living, then these 40 here, uh, the call, and then we're going to get the next 40 um, in the last section of his life. But he has this, of course, the burning bush experience. And the voice says to him, take off your sandals from your feet for where you are standing is holy ground. A practice that is still practiced uh, in many uh, cultures. In the Muslim culture, uh, when you go to worship, you take your shoes off to this day to go in those places. Um, in, if you go over to the Holy Land, in many of the places, the shrines and so forth, as a Jewish person, as a Christian, you take off your, your shoes. That, that has um, a way of recognizing the holy. Now, if we remember about the temple, the Sadducees, again, are the ones who attach themselves to the temple because they don't necessarily agree with worship in the synagogues because God resides in the temple. That's where the holy ground is. Well, wait a minute. Here, Stephen's saying, recalling the story of Moses saying, Take off, this is holy ground. So where is holy ground? Wherever God wants it to be holy ground. So that would be kind of a little slap at the Sadducees, okay? And of course, now, um, I will send you to Egypt. He's to go back to Egypt. And um, uh, then we continue with this story in uh, 35 through uh, 43. Would anybody want to take that chunk of text on? Missy. No, oh, Missy, Missy, all right, beat you, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, again, more summary of the story of Moses. Uh, one thing that's pointed out sometimes is at the end of verse 38, um, he's recounting this, Stephen, again to these um, religious authorities. And he said, uh, talking about Moses, he received the living oracles to give to who? Us. What's going to happen 
us, meaning me and you, we're in the room, we're all, what's going to happen as this story continues, it's going to start going, not us, but when you didn't do certain things. So right now it's still us, but it's going to change in the person. Okay? Let's uh, continue with 44 through 51. Judy, would you take, take that? Our ancestors had the steps of testimony in the wilderness. 53. Go ahead if you'd finish through um, 53, please. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law Okay, a little closing argument there, just in case they didn't get the point, right? Okay, so back to um, the beginning. He's still recounting, he had the tent of testimony again, this whole sense of trying to capture God, where God resided, where God dwelled. And so, you know, the people push this. We have stories of um, uh, who we read... uh, the calling of Samuel today in our Old Testament. And he's the one that ends up being sort of the, the go-between between God and the Israelites who sort of want this um, uh, temple built, or the, and they want this monarchy and all these kinds of things and uh, because they want to sort of be a powerful, like they want this place to worship, they, the, to contain God, that, that they can point to. They want their one king. They sort of kind of want the ways of the world. God sort of eventually says, David offers to do this. Um, yes, okay, but it's Solomon who carries it through. Solomon's temple they build. Um, but this sense of, uh, quote, uh, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. This is another shot right at the Pharisees who are claiming this is the place and they're talking about Jesus being resurrected and all this stuff is right in the face of that. And he quotes this stuff, um, I did not make all these things, where do I dwell? This is what Solomon says at the dedication of the temple, that God just doesn't dwell here. Solomon, even in his dedication, recognizes that God is in other places. And then just to make sure nobody missed the point, um, we get into these 51, you stiff-necked people, um, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Okay, this is right at the circumcision covenant. Um, You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as, again, not our ancestors, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become as betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law, yet you have not kept it. All right. So how does this go over um, to the people standing there? Let's uh, finish out uh, this chapter, 54 through 60s. Anybody? Thank you.
while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said that, when he had said this, he died. Okay. All right, so are they mildly upset? <laughs> no. When they heard this thing, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. I mean, this is, you know, this is. Um, and so you have anger as opposed to being filled, the next verse, with the Holy Spirit. Stephen, you have both these things coming. Um, and, and Peter, or excuse me, Stephen uh, looks up into heaven he saw the glory of Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's where we get this right hand from. This is the reference to Stephen's vision of seeing this. And he says out loud, look, <laughs> this is not going to necessarily calm things down, does it? I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Uh, but they, you know, covered their ears. No more. La, 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 la. And um, they, uh, with a loud shout, all rush together against him and they drag him out of the city. You can actually, in the Holy Land, go oh, and see the spot where uh, a church is built, but down you can go underneath where these rocks are supposedly been there for centuries or whatever, and they see they have this spot um, where this, so, uh, this supposedly happened. You know, I, I don't know about that, but it's in that area. But it gives you a sense outside the walls of where this is that they sort of drag him out of the city. It's downhill. It's like, like you know, they're not going uphill. You can see, you can just imagine this crowd sort of doing this um, in that area. So whether that's the right exact spot or not, don't know. But certainly in that area, it makes all kinds of sense uh, to see. Um, notice they don't arrive at a verdict. They do not pronounce him guilty. They just are mad and take matters into their own hands. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. So it seems to me like the story of Stephen is one of someone who is of Jewish background proves his knowledge of his Jewish heritage. Right. Correct. Okay. Right. And he's trying, like I said, he's not trying to save his own skin. He's not saying, so if you let me go, I'm still going to pre... No, th th this is an opportunity. He's not worried about that. You know, this is, this is, he sees an opportunity to proclaim. And this is not to make a defense for his life. It's to talk about what he believes. Again, Stephen's not one of the 12. We don't know uh, whether, you know, what Stephen's involvement with the human Jesus was, how much he knew of that, but he certainly was very active in the earliest church from the very beginning that when they say, let's pick seven names, let's put Stephen on the list. And if I remember right, I believe he's number one. Remember, we talk about how when they list something that usually you order importance, Stephen's the first one listed. So it's just like he's sort of the obvious choice of somebody we want to do that. Uh, whether he was an eyewitness or not to Jesus, to the events, I think is less known about that. Um, but they certainly talk about this group that witnessed when they wanted to um, replace um, Judas. That, you know, Stephen's name doesn't come up with that. Not to say that it couldn't. But so, I mean, I'm arguing from silence now because I'm meaning injecting my own things into that. But uh, at some point, he certainly comes to know that the risen Christ is the promised Messiah. And and comes to know it in such a way that he's fervent in his faith and his proclamation, and uh, becomes that. There's a reference here to the Son of Man. Um, here, this is the only place the reference Son of Man occurs outside uh, the Gospels, and uh, this is something that, again, uh, this is the, from the Gospel. When Jesus is in front of uh, his trial, he says... Um, He's being questioned for the chief priest, but Jesus says, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power. Get his right hand again. Uh, all of them, um, are you then the Son of God? You say that I am. So this, this sense of the Son of Man. And then Daniel, 
which um, this uh, apocalyptic view of the future makes reference to, I watched in the night visions, I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Now again, the Sanhedrin, these people that are taught in the faith and know the law and know the scriptures, would know this reference when he says Son of Man. They would think about the Daniel text, so that he's saying out loud, I see the Son of Man. Oh, wait a minute, that reminds me, that's the vision that Daniel talks about. Of that, so he is. There's little doubt that these people would have, and they're these are the, the people that are versed in uh, scripture. That they this doesn't this sticks out before in front of them uh, as he is being stoned and as he dies. Notice that it's likely not. It's the people who um, gather around or drag him out. The Sanhedrin is kind of like they kind of. Uh, you get the sense that they're kind of like hands off, that they're not the actual ones that sort of get their hands dirty. They sort of, the crowd rises up and drags Stephen. It, it, it doesn't necessarily say that it's the Pharisees and Sadducees came out from behind their place and they drug them. No, it's the people who are upset. They probably stood knowingly and shook their heads and said, good job, but they probably didn't get their hand, you know, just that sense of power and how things work sometimes in humanity sort of plays itself out there. Um, and, of course, in those verses, we have the first mention of uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, sort of being there. He uh, himself, again, is not doing it. He's a Pharisee. Um, he just, you know, I'll watch your coat here. Make sure nobody takes your coat while you take care of business. Um, so that kind of thing. So here's, you know, it's one of those things, here's my jacket. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'll hold the jacket. You go over and take care of them. You know, it's that, that type of thing that's going on. Any questions here? All right. Well, we're going to stop here and we'll pick up with chapter 8 uh, next time. What this, this sets off a whole now movement of people. We know that this, this banging back and forth of heads in the temple, this clash of this, this, this people of the way um, of the resurrection saying the promise of the Messiah in the, in, around the temples and the synagogues has now hit its head. And so things start to take a different direction for for the church. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you.